strikes from the United States. With lives in the balance, it doesn't seem too much to ask that journalists report carefully, which minimally involves separating assertions from facts. It also should involve refraining from simplistic and demonizing characterizations of people and cultures. But here we are with the August 28th New York Times explaining to readers that, quote, the vast majority of Arabs are emotionally opposed to any Western military action in the region, no matter how humanitarian the cause. Close quote. I guess an emotional opposition to warfare is different from a rational one, but in this case it seems neither would be acceptable. Over on ABC News the night before, Diane Sawyer and Martha Raddatz were chatting about how they once thought Bashar Assad was, well, a different kind of Arab. Sawyer notes that she's interviewed Assad and, quote, I should remind everybody, this is someone who grew up a lot of his life in London. He's a physician, educated there. Close quote. Raddatz picked up the theme saying, quote, it must be extraordinary for you to look at this man, as you say, educated in London, who's doing these kinds of brutal, brutal things. Close quote. So what's worse, that Sawyer and Raddatz are truly baffled at the idea of a Western educated person committing brutal acts, or that they think their job entails pretending that they are? Do you remember the Tea Party movement? The right wing uprising hasn't been heard from lately, but it looks like the Wall Street Journal is trying to change that, running a story on August 28th under the headline, Anger at IRS Powers Tea Party Comeback. But the article reads more like public relations than reporting. That IRS scandal in the headline is the driver of the story. Back in June, there were big headlines about how the IRS was targeting tax-exempt applications from Tea Party groups. But as the weeks went on, more facts came out that muddied up that storyline considerably. The targeting, in fact, was much broader, and it included some left-leaning groups as well. For most of the press, at that point, the scandal storyline more or less vanished. Someone forgot to tell the Rupert Murdoch-owned business paper, though, which in late August is basically acting as though that story about the IRS targeting the Tea Party is unchanged. So what's the evidence for the big Tea Party comeback anyway? Public opinion polls suggest the controversy has helped the movement's image, the journal reports. They cite exactly one poll taken in June amidst all of that IRS hype. That poll found that just 26% of the public had a positive view of the Tea Party. There's also a chart showing increased donations to the Tea Party patriots. It also stops in June, leaving the article's claim of a rebounding movement sketchy at best. Certainly the journal can editorially support the Tea Party if it chooses, but they do have a separate page for that. A lengthy piece on the August 25th front page of the Washington Post delivered its verdict. Despite the talk about cutting spending, as the subhead put it, government size largely the same. Reporter David Farenthold summons the evidence. The government will spend $3.455 trillion this year. That is a huge number. Case closed. But then he explains that that's down from 2010. And then you realize the numbers aren't adjusted for inflation. If you do that, government spending dropped 5% over that period. But, as economist Dean Baker explained, a more sensible measurement would be to express government spending as a share of the total economy. Once you do that, you learn that government spending has dropped considerably. Wasn't this article supposed to tell us the opposite? Farenthold also points to the size of the government workforce, which is also shrinking. 